Okay, great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Luce. I'm a software engineer with the Communication Storage Infrastructure Group at Intel. And I've been uh, developing storage software for a little over 20 years for Intel, uh, ranging everything from RAID firmware to Windows device drivers to some Windows file systems, uh, really all closed source stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of the whole OpenStack thing here. I've been working on Swift for probably the last uh, eight to 10 months. And uh, today, Tushar and I are gonna give you a bit of an overview of what we've been working on in the community along with uh, folks from SwiftStack and Box and Rackspace and Red Hat. So uh, I'll introduce Tushar now and then we'll get started. Hello. Tushar Gohar. Uh, I'm a software engineer in the storage division at Intel. Uh, been involved with open source for a while. Um, I came uh, two and a half years ago from uh, Monte Vista Software, which is an open source company. So I've been, was involved with Linux kernel from the, on the networking side and been in storage for the last three years at Intel. Um, same thing as Paul said, you know, OpenStack Swift, uh, been involved in there for last uh, last year or so. Okay, well, we've, we've actually got quite a bit of material. Um, so I wanna say just a few words about the agenda and what we're gonna be covering, and then we're gonna uh, jump right in. And if you have questions as we go along, it probably be better to hold them towards the end, just in case we run out of time. Tusha and I will both be available. Uh, we can step out in the hallway and cover any of this stuff in as much detail as, uh, uh, as you'd like to go through. Let me uh, get a quick show of hands here. How many folks are familiar with Swift, just to even know what it is? Oh, fantastic. Uh, how many were able to attend the session on Monday that I gave with John Dickinson, uh, the PTL, where we talked about policies? Okay, cool, a pretty decent number. Um, so this first section is gonna be kind of the, the Reader's Digest version of Monday's talk, um, but still meant to be incredibly informative for those of you that didn't make the talk. Second section, we're gonna talk about uh, erasure codes. This is where Tushar is gonna uh, jump in and give you uh, an overview of what we've been doing in that area with the community. <coughs> Um, erasure codes is really exciting for a bunch of reasons, um, and it's really cool. It builds right off of the storage policies. So if you got to attend the talk Monday or get a chance to review the materials, um, you'll see how it, it just flows really well with uh, what the community is working on with these two projects. And then Tushar will talk about Cosbench. Uh, how many folks have heard of Cosbench? Okay, good. So this will be informative since there's not a lot of you that are familiar with that. So Cosbench, well, better not go over there. <laughs> so Cosbench, uh, as Tushar will talk about, is, uh, is an object storage benchmarking tool um, that, again, it's, it's open source. It was contributed by Intel and um, maintained separately. Um, one of the things that we just want to make sure you didn't get, uh, get mixed up here is Cosbench is not Swift only. Okay, so Cosbench is uh, designed as a benchmarking tool um, meant to sort of become the industry de facto standard to run against any object storage uh, system that you want with uh, a plug-in model. I'll let Tushar go through the details of that. And then last but not least, um, wanted to just mention with one foil a public Swift test cluster that was announced this week. Uh, if you go to swiftstack.com and take a look at their blog, their news section, you'll see uh, about this activity and we'll talk about that at the end because um, we're pretty excited about that. That's kind of something um, neat uh, in the community that is a little different than these other development activities. Okay, so we can't really talk about storage policies without uh, doing a little bit of level setting on, on Swift. And I, and I know there's a lot of folks here that do have some good um, Swift background based on uh, the hands, but we'll at least define what it is. And, uh, and again, if anybody wants to talk more details uh, about what Swift is, we can do that afterwards. Uh, obviously, it's an, an object storage system. It's uh, one of the core projects uh, in OpenStack. Wanted to mention something about the, uh, the CAP theorem, um, the, uh, uh, specifically eventual consistency. There's been a few talks this week that you know, didn't completely quite get it right when they defined it. Um, John Dickinson had a talk last night, and I think he really set the record straight, so I'm just going to kind of repeat what he said. I'll say what it is not. It is absolutely not the case that it means when you write to Swift, it's like a posted write or something. It doesn't mean that you write it and eventually it's gonna make it to the disks. It's not what eventually consistent means. It means under certain conditions, failure conditions, or if something is really, really busy, maybe a window where the object exists on your server, it's stored durably, but if you go to list it, you might not see it in the listing yet. 
Okay, there's some other little corner cases where uh, other small strange things might happen, um, but it is definitely not the case that it means, you know, you write and uh, someday your data will get out, out there. That's not, that's not what it's all about. Another important concept in, in Swift specifically for explaining storage policies uh, is the notion of containers. So if you're familiar with S3, it's kind of like buckets, um, but again, it seems like a lot of folks are familiar with Swift. Uh, so you'll see how policies really leverages the, the container model for grouping objects of like characteristics uh, and, and leverages that to provide a new capability to applications. Uh, RESTful interface, I think that's uh, probably fairly well known by everybody, uh, and it's a cost efficient scale out built on uh, standard Intel hardware, right? Okay, so what does a, what does a real deployment look like, right? This is, uh, this is sort of the big picture all on one slide. Uh, you can see that the Swift architecture is sort of set up into tiers. This first box here at the top, um, we typically refer to as the access tier, and that's where modules like authentication uh, and a load balancer for dealing with multiple proxy servers uh, live, and, and then of course the proxy servers themselves, which in the Swift world sort of act like traffic cops, right? They field all the incoming requests, um, they rat around failures, they do all that kind of fun stuff, um, and, and really serve as traffic cops to, uh, to filter things out into the back end, into the private side of the cluster, which is what we call the capacity tier. And this is your collection of storage nodes um, that run all sorts of different services and do all sorts of cool stuff um, to maintain replication, um, to maintain uh, data integrity, and, uh, and this provides the, um, the scale-out capability on the capacity side. So this, this two-tier architecture um, is really cool in that it really gives you this independent scalability, right? You can go in and scale for concurrency by adding proxy nodes. You can scale for capacity um, by adding storage nodes. There's also, uh, I guess I should mention, there's, I don't know, probably another 200,000 ways to configure this. These services that I mentioned um, can actually all live on one box. They can live on um, multiple boxes. You can break out services into their own dedicated servers, depending on what your, uh, your usage uh, requirements are. So uh, it's incredibly flexible to meet just about any um, deployment scenario. So you can see an object comes in, it'll, it'll hit the load balancer. The load balancer will make a decision about which, uh, which proxy to use based on uh, whatever uh, algorithm the load balancer set up for. And then for our triple replication scheme, um, the ring, which we'll talk about a little bit more because it's another fundamental concept to storage policies, um, is consulted by the proxy server to determine where do I send these three copies of this object. Okay, so the object's now uh, at home on three servers. At some point later, um, a client is going to come in and request uh, to get access to that object and pretend that arrow goes through the load balancer because it really does. Um, it's going to hit the proxy and then it'll pick um, one of the object servers to retrieve the object. And there's a few different algorithms for deciding um, which server uh, to go choose, it, choose from. Um, that's not super important for what we're talking about here. I just wanted to mention that. It's not like one fixed server that it goes to all the time um, to retrieve data. So with that sort of intro uh, into, into Swift and what it is, I want to talk a little bit about why, why storage policies. Why did, uh, why did we decide to do this um, as a community? This, again, is not an Intel project that we dumped over the wall. This is an extremely collaborative effort. And like I said, it's been, it's been a real pleasure to work with this community, with the Swift Stack guys and the Red Hats and, and, and the boxes, especially when we get to the uh, erasure code piece. Um, but uh, we, we identified sort of collectively this set of technical opportunities. As flexible and usable as Swift is today with an object store, there are some technical opportunities that we address with storage policies. And the first one has to do with the, uh, the replication level. Right? I think uh, uh, probably most of you know you can, you can choose your replication level in Swift. It doesn't have to be three times, three copies. Right? You can do two or you can do four. Um, but you have to pick one, right? and that's it. That's what your cluster runs at. So we thought, wow, that's, that's probably an opportunity where we can add some uh, some improvement. Another one is today Swift will treat all nodes, all storage nodes, as if they're equals. Right? It doesn't matter what processors in them, what acceleration capabilities are in them, whether they have hard drives or uh, SSDs, um, they're all equals, right? With the one exception of account container databases. If you're familiar with, with Swift, you know you can actually specify, I want to store these databases on an SSD. Right, you do that for performance reasons. 
Um, but today, that's, that's really the only differentiation capability that you have with your storage nodes in Swift. And then finally, how would you go about adding something like erasure codes, right? A new durability policy, right? So let's say you don't want to do just double replication or triple replication, and it's not enough to say I want some of my cluster to be 2x and some of it 3x. I actually want to do something, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, keep up with the Joneses, right? And go in with the erasure code and get all of the benefits that Tushar is going to talk about. So these are things that without storage policies are, are really not that easy to go in and solve. So that's why we tackled this, this policies concept about, I guess we started on it uh, eight or nine months ago, I think. Um, so it's been, it's been a pretty significant effort. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more with a picture here in a minute about uh, really sort of what all the touch points are and you can get a feel for what we're doing. Okay, so I mentioned some of this already. These are the, uh, the, the technical opportunities, right? The ability to group things uh, by storage, the ability to add additional durability schemes, uh, and the ability to deal with new usage models. Now, I'll spend a lot more time on usage models here um, in a minute, because that's probably the most interesting thing for uh, deployers and users of Swift, as opposed to uh, when we talk about this in the design sessions later this week, it's, of course, the most interesting stuff is what's under the hood and you know, how did we make all the decisions we made. So one of, the, one of the fundamental concepts behind storage policies is the use of multiple object rings. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, you can take account in container databases and place those on SSDs for performance reasons, but you can't do that with object. Why is that? Because account and container databases have their own rings, and all object storage today share one ring. So, you know, the, the definition of storage policies can almost be done in just those five words right there. Introduction of multiple object rings. That's five, right? One, two, yeah, five words. There's uh, a, a nice picture here, and I haven't talked a whole lot about the ring, but um, we've got tons of material in backup, and there's all sorts of stuff uh, on the web. It's a really interesting topic, and if we didn't have so much other stuff we wanted to get through today, I would, I would just love to go through it in detail. But today, with triple replication, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the proxy or whatever service needs to look up the location of an object within the cluster, triple replication, it would go out to the ring structure and it would go get um, three locations. For reduced replication, it would just simply go out and get two locations, right? It's just a separate, uh, a separate ring. And then erasure codes, uh, we were able to really leverage uh, all of the features of uh, the ring code by representing fragments on the ring as opposed to copies. So we'll get into a lot more detail on that when, when Tushar goes through the erasure code section. Second key element to this with storage policies is just one piece of metadata. So there's one API change to enable all of the usage models we're gonna go through. So it's, it, it's just really exciting how, how much and how wide the variety of features and capabilities we get out of adding an object ring and adding one little API change. So this API change is this thing called X storage policy, and an application simply needs to specify that when it creates a container. That's it. You never do anything else, right? So the cloud administrator, the cluster administrator has to define the policies and of course set things up and get things configured, but then it just simply provides human readable policy names to the applications and the applications say, all right, if I want to have this data stored in triple replication, I'm gonna give it the name triple and it'll be stored at triple replication when it's stored in a container that was created with that policy name. If it then wants to turn around and store a different object using erasure code, it just writes it to a different container that was created with an erasure code name as its policy. So really, really simple interface for applications to take advantage of all this. Okay, so this, this is a high level software architecture black diagram that covers all of Swift. Um, and I, I won't go through any painstaking detail here to uh, give everybody the lowdown on how Swift is built and what these interfaces look like. Really the intent of this slide is to, is to show you what we had to go and, and, and muck with to get storage policies to work. Uh, it, it's a significant undertaking. It's taken a long time with a lot of people uh, and their hard work on it. In fact, if you made the Monday talk, right, the title of that talk actually came from John, our, our PTL who called this the, the biggest thing to hit Swift since the project was open sourced. And that biggest refers to both its significance and its impact on the operation of Swift, um, and, and quite frankly, on the size, <laughs> right? So this, uh, this patch set, it's a series of patch sets that we've been working on uh, off to the side. 
I, I think we're really close to being done. Um, been saying that for weeks, but I'm gonna say it again, we're really close to being done. Uh, I, I think at the end, we'll be close to 5,000 lines of code uh, on this patch set, and Swift, including test code, total is around 60,000. Um, so it's a pretty significant um, chunk of code. And you can see here uh, on the proxy side, we're hitting three of the major modules, um, and then down on the object server, um, you know, a significant number of services that run on the object server um, all need some sort of you know, plumbing update or functional update uh, to uh, effectively utilize these policies and guarantee that all of the uh, different kind of weird conditions that you can get into with the introductions of policies uh, are handled appropriately. Okay, so let's look at a couple of usage models. Uh, these are probably pretty obvious the way I described them already, but you know, pictures are always nice to, uh, uh, to get a better understanding of what we're talking about. So uh, let's say you've got a container with a, a 3x policy in a cluster that's already set up. Like I said, today with Swift, if you wanted to change that to 2x, you could, but it would take effect across the entire cluster. With policies, you just simply create another container and you point the ring associated with that container to the devices that you want it to use and now when you write to that container, you get double replication. You write to the 3x container, you get triple replication. So we're allowing you to effectively segment your cluster um, based on uh, whatever criteria you want to come up with. And this one shows a redundancy criteria. Here's another thing that right, is totally different kind of usage model. Right? We can now create a performance tier, just like you do with account and container databases. So it's not related to redundancy, but it's the same exact uh, set of code you have a container with your HDD policy, which would be your, you know, what we're calling now the legacy ring with storage policies. You could go in and then create a, uh, a new container that points to SSDs, right? Maybe they're the same SSDs as your databases, maybe not, it's whatever you wanna do, but now you've got a, a low latency tier that you access, your application accesses uh, via a container. Okay, here's another one that, again, is just totally different than the other two, but enabled by the same exact code base and the same exact philosophy. Um, with geotagging, and this is still sort of a work in progress, and uh, I'll explain why that is here in a second, but with, with geotagging, let's say you have one cluster, maybe it's a globally distributed cluster, maybe it's um, within one site and you've got certain areas, physical areas that you wanna make sure stay isolated. Uh, it could be for regulatory reasons, it, it could be for whatever reasons. Um, there are some capabilities in Swift today with global clusters and regions uh, that allow you to uh, help segment things, but there's nothing today that would say, uh, I wanna guarantee that when I write to this container, it never leaves this geography, or it never leaves this data center, regardless of anything else, any other changes I make with replication or rebalancing or anything, I have to have a guarantee that it never leaves. So you just simply create one container and point it to the right physical media that, that, are, that meet the criteria that you have for that isolation, and you create another one um, with, uh, with its set of criteria. And that way you have that guarantee built in. Now I call this kind of a work in progress because we haven't addressed isolation of container and account metadata yet. Um, that's kind of a, a blueprint that we'll be drafting here as soon as we get the rest of policies done and, and merged onto our master branch. Um, but still, it's, it's kind of another, uh, at least for me, it's a really exciting example because it's so different than performance tearing. It's so different than durability. Uh, with erasure code and so different than what we get with um, multiple replication schemes within the same cluster. So just so many different things out of, out of one feature is, is just coolness. Okay, and then, and then finally, uh, erasure codes. Um, again, there's our container with the triple X policy and all we have to do is create a new container and point the ring to a different number of drives in the cluster and as Tushar will go through, these now represent fragments of your object as opposed to the object itself. So we're no longer using the ring to track copies, we're using it to track fragments. And as you can imagine, this involves some code bat changes as well. It's not just a mapping type thing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tushar and he's gonna give you the overview of erasure codes and where we're at with that. Well, uh, continuing with usage models for switch storage policies, uh, here's the first significant storage policy in Swift that we are working on as the storage policies code gets merged into Swift Master. Uh, how many of you are familiar with erasure codes? All right, so 25%. So I'll, 
I'll go with, uh, in, into some details here. So, let's see if this, if this works. All right. I think I guess I'll probably just try it. Okay. So, erasure coding is a, a an alternate data durability scheme where an object is not replicated but split into, you know, in, in, using the standard, standard terminology, um, K data and M parity chunks. So essentially, you, you're getting, uh, as, they, as they call it, space optimal redundancy uh, and, and higher high availability because you, you're, you're taking your object, uh, putting it through a, a process called encode, which uh, applies some Galois field math uh, to, to the object, calculates uh, you know, additional uh, fragments called parity fragments in addition to the, to the data chunks. And essentially, those chunks are distributed across your cluster. And by, by distributing the chunks across, across clusters, you can tolerate um, M node or cluster failures, essentially. So, so this, uh, this actually gives you higher availability than a, a triple replication or, in general, a replication scheme. There are papers uh, you know, that, can, that can support that statement. Um, so, so in terms of so talking about space optimality, uh, if you actually uh, split your object into 10 chunks and added, uh, let's say, four parity fragments as uh, you know, for, for data protection, you you essentially use 50% less space than you would have when, when you went, went for triple replication. So uh, erasure codes, since they involve uh, Galois field math, they, they come with a, a cost, which is essentially higher compute requirements than the replication. In replications, it's, it's mainly simply copying data uh, in, in Erasure codes, you are encoding an object when you're splitting it into, in, and spreading across your cluster. And when you're doing a re object reconstruction from, from these fragments, you, you essentially incur a lot, lot more CPU compute uh, requirement. And you know, basically, given, uh, given that these are called erasure codes, I mean, I'll just explain the word erasure quickly here. The reason they're called erasure codes is because Unless you know, uh, you know which which of these data chunks were in erasure, as in were lost. Unless you know which chunks were lost, you cannot reconstruct those. Uh, if you if you don't know, you know what data you lost, then then you cannot. So that's why they are they're called. And so essentially, it is it is uh, uh, essential to know what data chunks were in erasure, and. And when you actually put it all together into an erasure code scheme, it also means higher network bandwidth because you actually have to figure out in your network you know, what chunks went missing. So higher compute and network requirements essentially make it suitable for, more suitable uh, for archival workloads where you have a high, higher percentage of writes and you're reading less often, like uh, you know, traditionally called cold storage workloads, where you, you essentially, in quotes, deep freeze your data, and then you rehydrate it you know, less number of times than, than you essentially write. Now, let's look at it in the, in, in the Swift context. Um, so the regular replication path in, in Swift, in the uh, change to erasure code scenario here, uh, you, you have a client that's up uploading an object. The object essentially uh, you know, arrives at the proxy. Um, the proxy passes the, the object through, through, through something called an erasure code encoder, which, which essentially splits the objects into, I'm going to use the standard terminology here, K plus M fragments, and, split, and basically distributes those across the Swift cluster. Um, and the, the download process or the re, reconstruction or the decode process is essentially the, uh, the opposite. So, so, so the, because you have K data fragments and M parity fragments, the, the rule in, uh, with erasure codes is that you can uh, reconstruct your data 
from any of the k fragments. So, so it's essentially, if you, if you had total k plus m equals n fragments, you can, you can do an a, n choose k, get all those data chunks at the proxy, and, and be able to re reconstruct them. So, so essentially, when a, when a client uh, download request comes in, the proxy gets k fragments, and de puts them together through, again, Gallo field math, which is you know, high in compute. And, and of course, network requirements, because you, you are, you're essentially pulling from more than one node here, and, and reconstructs the object and delivers it to the client. So, so that's sort of the swift uh, erasure coding scenario, the bigger picture. So, so what does it take to add um, erasure coding support to Swift? I mean, Paul uh, and, and the community has been uh, doing the great work of adding the foundation for, for adding uh, the erasure codes. So, so erasure codes do, do build upon um, the, the storage policies framework. Uh, the, the next, uh, I mean, you know, I'll just skip through the animation so that I can quickly cover this. So, Essentially, uh, so, so erasure coding policy is, is uh, available, will be available in, in Swift at, at the container level granularity, which, which kind of follows from the storage policy design, where uh, all, all the objects in a, in, a, in a container, I mean, if the container is ta tagged with a erasure code policy, then all the objects inside a container will be erasure coded. Um, we, we chose to do a, a proxy-centric inline erasure coding as opposed to offline erasure coding. So I'll go into uh, a bit of detail on that. So inline erasure coding is essentially the proxy uh, doing erasure code uh, you know, as the object, object is streamed in and pushing the, the, the erasure code fragments to the object servers. Whereas offline design would have been uh, the, the proxy basically uh, download, you know, uploads the data to the object servers as it comes in, essentially replicates, and you, in downtime, you, you basically move up the objects into an erasure coded container. So that would have been done at the storage node level. But as, as I said, uh, erasure coding comes with a higher compute cost, which, uh, which basically makes it more suitable for an inline uh, transcode design, uh, encode design, because the proxy is, is essentially uh, the, the focus of uh, de demanding services in, in Swift. So that's where you're, you're likely to find more compute power as opposed to storage nodes. Um, leveraging the current architecture, um, so essentially uh, the repair is, is, is a big part of, uh, you know, an important piece of the, the, this design, the scheme, where if you, if you have a disk failure, if you, if you have a node failure, if you have a cluster failure, if you, have, if you go and get into bit rot, where you, you are basically missing one fragment of an object, um, you, you know, the, the repair scheme uh, kind of get, gets, gets, gets pretty, pretty involved. So we, we basically uh, chose to leverage the current uh, Swift auditor, uh, most of it, and, and come up with a with the, you know, change the re replicator to be the erasure coding reconstructor. So most of it was essentially leveraging the current architecture. I won't go into too much detail on that, but uh, the, you know, here, here is his sort of a, a, a snapshot of what, what we had to change uh, to, to make Swift erasure coding aware. So as you can see, in, in, in the proxy nodes and in the storage nodes, we, there, there were um, existing uh, modules like uh, the object control at the proxy, the, the whiskey application uh, where in the storage node uh, where we, we actually had to uh, change, you know, there was some additional metadata that had to be incorporated. Uh, we had to uh, come up with a new EC reconstructor. And one of the important pieces here is, is that all the intelligence to do the erasure code, encode, uh, decode, and repair, uh, we, we basically chose to move out of Swift into a, a library, which, uh, which ended up being a separate project, which uh, Swift talks to for uh, erasure coding. Uh, it's the, the library essentially uh, implements the, the, the API that's shown here. Uh, 
so, so we actually chose to keep the API simple enough uh, for projects like Swift to, uh, to incorporate. So this is, a, this is not Swift specific library, but it was uh, developed uh, along with the Swift community, you know, uh, with this project, the Irish coding project in Swift as the first user. So um, this is essentially a Python interface wrapper library with uh, pluggable C backends. Uh, the, the, the primary reason uh, for creating this library, one, uh, one was being a favorable licensing model as opposed to uh, some other libraries that exist out there like ZFEC. Uh, also, this library is, was designed with, with, with performance in mind and so we, we actually have, uh, it's essentially a convenience wrapper uh, that, that wraps the C erasure code backends or hides the details of C erasure code implementations from, from a Python user. Right? <coughs> so in, um, in version 1.0 that should be coming out pretty soon here, we are, um, we are supporting J erasure which is a uh, very popular erasure coding uh, backend, uh, a flat XOR backend that, that was recently presented at, at the FAST conferences and also an Intel Intelligence Storage Acceleration Library uh, scheme, erasure coding scheme that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute here. The library is BSD licensed, it's, uh, it's hosted on Bit Bitbucket, uh, so it's, this is another open source project. Uh, it was jointly developed by uh, Box, uh, which is another storage company. Uh, th there are, there's some erasure coding researchers working at the company that uh, we, we have, we have basically their, their blessing for this library and also the Swift community. Now, I'll introduce a, uh, a storage acceleration library uh, that, that we, uh, the storage division at, at Intel develops. It's called the Intelligent Storage Acceleration Library, um, which basically provides primitives for accelerating storage functions like encryption, uh, compression, dedupe, uh, integrity checks, etc. So, so as you can see, uh, the, the, as, as of the, uh, version 2.10, the library basically supports the, these primitives. Essentially, uh, there is an op open source version out there. Um, so so I, should, I should back up a little bit and, and talk about the library licensing again. So essentially the, the library is, is right now uh, available with, a, with an agreement uh, with, with Intel. Uh, but there is an, there's an open source version out there which, was, which basically provides uh, just erasure code support today. Uh, and it, why is this library, uh, why does this exist? It's, it's, it was basically written to uh, parallelize, you know, uh, take advantage of the Intel SIMD primitives to parallelize the erasure coding operations. Um, and it's, it's shown to be order of magnitude faster than the normal ta table lookup methods. It supports uh, the Reed Solomon, Vandermond met matrix, matrices, as well as Cauchy schemes. It, uh, so, so it, like, you know, there are several other uh, non Reed Solomon schemes that were designed. Uh, so that you you don't have to uh, essentially go out to uh, go out to your cluster and and fetch uh, you know like basically look for the, the as many missing fragments. But with the with the acceleration provided by this library, um, you know it, essentially those, those those methods are pretty much irrelevant. Uh, it's available on zeroin.org for download. It's BSD licensed. So, all right. So, uh, so just kind of summarizing the, the project uh, project status here. So, uh, PyECLib, um, which is the Python EC interface library, is upstream on Bitbucket and Py, PyPy. That's available for download today, or, and and even it's it, it's it's at version 0 0.9, which is stable enough to use. Uh, storage policies is uh, is in plan for including uh, inclusion in OpenStack Juno. And EC erasure coding, we are, we are actively working on the data path. There are design uh, sessions uh, this week at the Swift, Swift design track. So if you, if you are interested, uh, you're welcome to join the, the session tomorrow at 5 p.m. 
Um, there, there's always the OpenStack Swift IRC, and we, we actually have a Trello uh, discussion board for uh, discussions on erasure code design, so you're welcome to contribute. And the blueprints, the several blueprints that, that are available for comments or um, you know, contribution. And finally, Intel ISL, if you're interested in the, in the primitives other than erasure code, uh, you're welcome to check out our storage page on intel.com. So with that, I'll um, changing gears here a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a, a benchmark tool um, that was introduced at, at the Portland Design Summit last year. It's called COSBench. Um, stands for Cloud Object Store Benchmark Tool. Um, so th this was th this was basically brought in to to kind of address the gap in the object storage space where. Uh, where you actually have a single tool that addresses multiple uh, object store backends and also exposes uh, you know, the, the performance metrics that, that IOMeter would for, for block storage. IOMeter is, is pretty much considered a, a standard uh, tool for block store, uh, supports distributed client server model, uh, it lets you, lets you analyze performance scalability of a block storage system. Uh, so think about Cosbench, uh, a, a replacement for that in the object world. It is open source. It is Apache licensed. Uh, it is Cosbench is cross-platform. It uses the Apache OSGI framework. It can run on uh, pretty much all Windows or Unix platforms uh, that support Java. It is Cosbench is distributed. Um, so. Essentially, uh, there is a controller and driver model. Controller is essentially your test control interface. Um, control as in launch, manage, monitor workloads. Uh, drivers are essentially nothing but test generators. And, uh, and it's, it's a scalable model where uh, you know, a single, single workload configuration can be distributed to multiple test generators. And you can add test generators as, as, you, as you will. Um, in terms of storage backend support, we support not just the OpenStack Swift object storage, but, but also some other commercial ones, as well as open source ones like Ceph. Uh, we did recently introduce CDMI adapt, backend adapters for Cosbench. And we do have, like if you, if, if you uh, need to do stuff like uh, Cosbench, you know, uh, tuning or, how should I say, calibration, that's the right word. We, we do have some mock adapters which can, or something like an, a none adapter, which is like a null adapter um, to, to check the, the calibration of the tool. So I'll, I'll talk about the flexible workload definition uh, and the performance monitoring aspects in the next couple of slides. So Cospinch uh, supports a, I mean, you know, the. The configuration format for Cosbench uh, is essentially XML, so it's extensible. Uh, you can uh, you, you can define all sorts of complex workflows, uh, object sizes, object size distributions, uh, into, uh, all combined with read, write, uh, delete percentages uh, per stage. Uh, we and, and and typically you can you can actually mix and match stages. Um, <coughs> Workload. So essentially, you know, it's, it's very extensible, flexible. You can add your own object store support to it and extend this format, and it, it'll work. So, okay. So, Cosbench um, yeah, controller exposes a real-time monitoring UI, which is a which is a web UI. Which, uh, which consolidates uh, information from, from all the drivers into a single interface where uh, you, you essentially have, have all the drivers listed by, uh, by their names, IP addresses. You can, you can go into the details there. You, it shows you at what, what workloads are running along with their states um, and, and also workload history. In terms of performance reporting, um, Gosbench essentially reports 
uh, you know, response times, throughput, bandwidth, success ratios for for your workloads. This is this is at, this is done at real time, at five second interval typically. Uh, at the at the end of the test run, it will it will also generate a response time histogram for you, which you can plot. Uh, which is it, it's a standard CSV format, um, and. And this chart shows that you can actually do a uh, scalability analysis of your uh, of your workload, along with uh, you know uh, along with workers, which is essentially uh, the number of connections, simultaneous connections to cost bench. Yeah, so this is sort of the progress report since the since the uh, OpenStack Havana release. We've added several uh, new storage backends. We have added uh, new authentication mechanisms. There are new features in terms of job management. Um, uh, one feature that I would like to point out, which actually takes Cospinch a step closer to Iometer, is a batch workload configuration UI. So we, uh, if, if you check out the 0.4 version of Cospinch, um, it essentially lets you configure uh, multiple uh, objects, object sizes, multiple number of uh, worker combinations, basically, you know, a, a whole, whole uh, combination, uh, you know, I should say, a number of combinations of workflows using a single screen, essentially. Um, on, on the roadmap for, uh, for this year is essentially uh, multi-part uploads for objects. We, we do, uh, we also want to turn it into a profiling tool, and there's also Google and Azure storage support coming up. This slide um, shows you, uh, you know, the, the current industry users uh, for Cospinch, and the top activity is actually, top chart is probably more important from an open source point of view. Uh, Cospinch is uh, hosted on GitHub, uh, and this, this chart shows the activity. I mean, I actually captured this uh, towards the end of April. We actually had, uh, in two weeks, we, we had 150 unique visitors and 15, 20 views. So this is an active project. Uh, you're, you're welcome to contribute, rather encouraged to contribute. So here's some more information. That's the, uh, it's, it's Cosbench is hosted under the, under the Intel Cloud account on GitHub. <coughs> And we do have a mailing list where, where you can post questions. It is actively monitored. And we do have within storage division and other Intel divisions supporting Cosmich. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Paul, who is going to introduce you to the, uh, to the Swift test cluster we recently deployed. Cool. Thanks, Tushar. Um, what, one other thing about uh, erasure code and the status that uh, uh, we didn't mention, and also I just want to make super clear. <laughs> We mentioned policies is just about done. That will be in a swift release sometime over the summer. Um, and then, you know, overlap with, with Juno, of course. Erasure code, as Tushar mentioned, is still in the design phase. We do have some code, but there's still a lot of opportunity for contributors to come in um, to our design session tomorrow. And we also uh, are sponsoring a hackathon um, a week from next week, two weeks from now. I don't know, second, second of June uh, in Colorado, and we've got um, I think right now 28 uh, uh, core and active Swift community developers that are coming together for four days. Um, we're going to be working on more than just erasure code, but um, there's still a, a couple of empty slots there, uh, and we expect to make a lot of progress on the design uh, and come out of there with some real action items to continue to uh, build up our erasure code branch. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, as I mentioned at the, uh, at the top of the hour here, uh, you can go to the SwiftStacks website and read the full press release, but we did want to mention it here. Uh, it is relevant to uh, some of our contributions to object storage. We've got uh, a public test cluster that Swift is, uh, owns and operates, and, and they're uh, bringing up there in San Francisco. Uh, it's using uh, Intel processors, some of our latest processors, uh, built for object storage, the 2750, I only know the code names, not used to part numbers. Uh, but you can see it's a pretty small cluster. This is kind of just to test the waters and to really augment the current VM-based testing. Uh, and we expect, uh, as this becomes more successful, this will grow over time, and we'll really begin to see uh, some noticeable improvement in, uh, in quality and catching issues that we can only find on real hardware versus VMs. So yeah, I encourage you to go check out that blog. It gives you a little bit more information than just what it looks like. And that's what we got for you. Uh, any questions? 
Yes. With regard to storage policies, uh, having all your container databases on SSDs can be very expensive on a large <coughs> system. Have you considered um, storage policies for container databases? Uh, yeah, I kind of mentioned that uh, around the geotagging usage model. So our, our approach to storage policies was to first attack uh, the object side and leave the other rings the way they are and leave that plumbing in place. And we will definitely be talking about that over the summer. Uh, but first priority is getting policies wrapped up and merged on the master and available for, for mass use. And then uh, uh, if it wasn't obvious, a lot of the same people that um, are doing the policy work were shifting gears and going right into erasure code. And there's more people coming on board to work on erasure code, but uh, you know, at the same time, we'll start to look at uh, account container rings for policies as well. Thank you. Good question, though, thanks. Uh, do you think there are concepts and lessons learned that can be applied to, uh, from Cosbench that can be applied to the Cinder world as well? From Cosbench? As far as performance tuning and looking at how things are working under the cover? Uh, you know, that, that's a good question. I think, I think primarily the, uh, the original developers of Cosbench and, and Tushar's contributed to it and some of our guys in PRC uh, you know, really owned and started it. I think they kind of looked at it the other way around. Um, from the block side of the house, I think there's a, a pretty significant history and knowledge base of, of how to do performance benchmarking um, across different back ends, depending on what your abstraction is. It really wasn't there on the object side. So, um, so I'm not sure, it's a, it's a good question, but I really think we were more thinking about how do we take BKMs from block and move them into object. Are we totally out of time now? What does that mean? One more question? Two more we're questions? out of time. We're out of time. OK, so I guess we're, we're out of time. Um, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll hang out over here, and then we can step outside and answer any other questions. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.